What we're going to talk about today are four projects we've been working on that um, I, that are like more fresh, I say, off the cooker. Um, if you guys are interested in talking later about our older stuff, which is a lot of pesticide non-target effects things, especially focusing on mites and how weed management, including herbicide use, can affect natural enemies, I'm happy to talk about that uh, during the discussion or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so this is going to focus on, as I said, these four projects. One is natural enemy releases, um, some of our work on trachnites, some of our work that we've been doing um, with Louie and Robert on earwigs, and then finally a little teeny tiny intro to a, a new project on mite natural enemies in pairs. Uh, so in terms of natural enemy releases in pairs, this is a really new project for us. So we've been doing augmentation by purchasing uh, beneficials from insectaries and then releasing them since 2020 um, and mostly focusing on apples. And then this year we switched to include pears. And this is basically the one of the big backbones of my research program. And we're hoping to get you guys some really good scientifically based recommendations on how to do this and not waste a crap ton of money in the process. But I will say this is slow going compared to getting you good recs for how to use a new pesticide because there are a lot of things that can go wrong when living organisms get involved. So, and uh, I also want to thank my project manager, Danny Hausler, who's over, over there. I brought a, a good chunk of my team today. So uh, feel free to probe them for questions too, as you have them. So these trials were focused on looking at what is commercially available and does it do anything for parasilla management? Uh, so we looked at minute pirate bugs and lace wings. We also looked at supplementary food products, and these products are primarily coming from the greenhouse industry. And what they're doing is they're actually using blowers to apply pollen to plants to basically get their beneficial populations up. And they've also come out with a new product that's on tape. And what's really nice about tape is it's very easy to hang from a tree. It's kind of similar in consistency to flagging tape. And it has de-encapsulated brine shrimp cysts on it, aka sea monkey eggs, which are a really great protein source for natural enemies. And I'll show you some of that. And then we've also been working with lures. So th for those of you who are unfamiliar um, with drone dispersal of natural enemies, this is what that looks like. This is a parabug drone. Uh, Chuck is piloting this. So if you want to hear more about uh, drone drops of natural enemies, feel free to talk to Chuck, who's here. Um, and they are a really effective way to get natural enemies uh, throughout the orchard really quickly, but there are some caveats to that, which I'll talk about. So in apple, and because this is also a problem in pear, especially organic pear, I'm going to talk a little bit about our mealybug destroyer work. Um, we want to see if we can uh, kind of cross apply some of that knowledge. So we've started doing mealybug destroyer work in 2020. We started with really small plots. Um, and we basically wanted to know when should you go in with these applications and how many should you release? And if you release them by drone, does it work just as well as if you release them by hand? Um, so our early timing corresponds to basically as soon as you can get them out there without probably killing them due to a frost event. Our later timing corresponds to when the mealybugs are starting to do ovisacs. Um, that's important for these mealybug destroyers because they actually deliberately target ovisacs and will lay their eggs like right next to them. Uh, as a nice little snack for when their babies hatch. And then um, we also did two, the two rates. The high rate was what the insectary said, this is what you want to do if you're treating a hot spot. The low rate was more of their across the whole orchard recommendation. I will say, and the insectaries will acknowledge this, take these recommendations with like the world's biggest grain of salt because they're all coming from low canopy crops like strawberries and greenhouse crops, which are very, very not relevant to what we do in our environment. So they're making their best guess because they don't have any additional information for you and they're very open about that. Um, so this is kind of the best guess scenario. So this year, the, this year in 2020, what we found is one week after release and two weeks after release, we had pretty decent recovery of these adult mealybug destroyers and you'll see them circled there on the beet tray. And then after that, we would literally find one. And so, and I'm not talking one per plot, I'm talking one in the whole experiment every week. So these are very, very difficult to find upon recovery. And I don't know if that's because they're hanging out in the tip top of the canopy where there's no way for us to get at them with a beet tray, or if it's because they've gone. And they are very highly dispersive. So them being gone is definitely a possibility. We did see some promise in the first year, especially with all of the ground-based treatments. It seemed like the rate didn't matter. 
the timing didn't matter. As long as it wasn't done by drone, it worked. The reason the drone doesn't work is because these are positively phototactic insects, AKA they fly towards light. So if you release them at the top of the canopy, they will literally zip out of the drone and then fly towards the sun. So you might be helping your neighbor out accidentally, uh, but then all further studies that we did where we tried doing dusk and dawn releases, we also didn't really see a great effect of the drone. So this might be one of those insects that's so highly dispersive, drone drops are not great for it. You might want to try ground. And I'll talk about why you might want, not want to try it at all in the following slides. So if you try bigger plots and space them further apart so you get maybe better effects looking at your trial, and you try to get them in really, really early when there's almost no mealybug pressure, they disappear for forever. You will never find them again because they are so specialized on mealybugs. When they realize they're not there, they will disappear. So no luck in 2021. 2022, we put them out. And as we're finishing the round with the drone, I hear the sound of a sprayer starting up. <laughs> I come running out of the block and I walk up to the guy in the rig and I go, what you doing and where are you going? He goes, into the block you just came out of. And I'm like, what are you spraying? He's like, oh, it's fire blight material. Don't worry about it. One, I think these natural enemies, when we first put them out, are incredibly sensitive to anything you do to them, including spraying them with water, especially pressurized water. So I think we literally just yeeted them out of the trees. But two, I've heard from a few folks that have been doing releases for a while that they suspect some of the organic fire blight products, and this was an organic orchard, may actually be harmful or repellent to natural enemies. We still have to do work to follow up on that idea, but it's definitely a possibility. So don't assume that because it's not an insecticide, it can go on at the same time as you're doing these releases. I say all this to point out that this particular insect costs, if you're finding a really, really great deal somehow, like a major bulk discount, 30 cents a bug. And if you're not finding a good discount, 50 cents a bug. So if you're doing this and then spraying, you've literally like yeeted quarters, you might as well be throwing quarters out of your pockets and onto the ground for several hours. So I, I am not a fan of this bug in orchard environments. I just haven't seen it work well enough to justify the cost. And I've heard from other people in viticulture and from other countries that they kind of are feeling the same way about it. So I think until we get more info showing that this is worth your money, maybe no. And that's all I have to say about that one because I hate trash talking a, a perfectly good lady beetle question. You can, from one vendor that I'm aware of, get them as juveniles. And we did do that in the trial where they got sprayed out with the fire blight material and saw no, those actually went out a week, the juveniles went out a week before the fire blight spray because we got them earlier. I didn't see any difference in retention, um, but yeah, they, you can get them as juveniles. They are even more expensive to buy as juveniles and then adults. So the other question we had is, okay, what about for Perisola? What about the two natural enemies that are available on the market that are most likely to do something to Perisola? And I will say these are not great Perisola natural enemies in an orchard. Do they contribute? Absolutely. Are they our main contenders? What we heard from folks earlier today was, no, not really. They're not our big focuses, but this is what's available on the market. So this is what we tested. Shockingly, the answer is not so much. <laughs> they do not do a great job at parasilla cleanup. This is just the egg counts post-release. The counts for all the other stages look very similar. There's no separation between treatments. It doesn't really seem like the releases did anything. And we found no evidence that the predators even stuck around. So I, I don't think they're, they're that into eating so much. Um, and that's, that's the main thing they have to eat. They don't stick around. We don't see efficacy. So I would say no go on what is currently commercially available in terms of controlling Paracilla. There are other great ways that what's commercially available can be used, especially in Apple for aphid control. Um, if anybody who also does apples wants to chit chat with me about that, I'd be happy to, but pears looks like not so much. The other thing we did was look at increasing retention of natural enemies. And so this was something we did both in apples and pears. And the idea from this comes from using lures that smell like plant alarm pheromones that are basically the plant saying, hey, I'm being eaten by something. And there are predators that are interested in that smell because they know that means there's something good at the end of that smell. 
And there are these supplementary food products that I mentioned that predators will eat if they don't have prey around. So our idea was, what if we ring the dinner bell and provide them with a snack? Will that increase the likelihood that a released natural enemy sticks around? And will it bring in natural enemies that are already present in the environment and get you an added little boost there? So we did this in a commercial apple orchard, a commercial pear orchard, and a research apple orchard. And we were focusing again on those lace wings and the minute pirate bugs. And so you can see we did these combinations of releasing the natural enemies, having food or not food, having lure, no lure, and then one control where we did absolutely nothing. This is what those predator lures look like. Um, this is a commercially available product. They come in little sachets. They smell incredibly strongly of mint, so you'll know you have the right product if you open it and you think of toothpaste. These are the little brine shrimp uh, cyst tapes. And as you can see, there are insects that will come along and eat the little tape, the cysts on the tape. Um, so the cysts are right along the edges of the tape, right where that ladybug is. You can kind of see the little orangey marks. And then you can also buy a fescia or clothes moth eggs on the same little cards that lace wings come on. And so that's another potential supplementary food product. And those are not, they're sterilized eggs and they're also not a pest in apple. So they're, they're not going to do anything harmful to, to, your, to your crop. However, in pairs, none of these treatments helped. <laughs> so again, we're not really seeing any good evidence that what's commercially available is great for parasilla control. And I'm going to highlight in verbally the words parasilla control because in commercial apples, we did find that these lures were very attractive to stethorus. And we found that in sections where we use the lures, so ignore the food products, in this orchard that had a pretty gnarly brown mite problem because it's our research orchard and we like it that way, we actually got a pretty decent dip in brown mite numbers. And this was late in the season, so their numbers had gone nuts at this point. So I think it wasn't the release natural enemy that was doing the work here. I think they were we were calling in the stethorus and they were starting to clean up our brown mite problem. So if you've got spider mite issues, including two spots, um, if you are a grower who's in hops also, this might be a potential solution. And I think we should dig into it a little bit further is the use of these lures specifically for bringing in stethorus for mite control. That's all I'll say on the release stuff. There's a ton of other things we've been doing, looking at lace wing efficacy. Um, like I said, that's really a big backbone of our research program. Um, so if folks have questions about that, specifically in the realm of Apple, happy to chat. On to the, uh, the track question. So we've been working on this one for four years. Um, surprisingly, we just don't know that much about Trachnides biology. Like the, despite how important it is in parasilla management, uh, just we just haven't dug into it. So one of the questions we wanted to know is how do we monitor these things? What's the best way to get an accurate representation of how many you have? What factors affect how abundant they are in orchards? And what pesticides are harmful to them? And this project's been led by my postdoc, Gabe Zilnick, for the last two years. Um, so on that slide, you'll see the four different methods we tested for monitoring. One of them, as demonstrated by my 2019 crew, is our standard from the beat sheet. We've got a sticky card. And then we have a sticky card that is covered in a green, which is what this particular card is here. Um, as you can see, one of them has way fewer nasty filth flies on it. Our research orchard is next to a dairy and nicely demonstrates the fact that these screens get rid of a lot of insects that we're not interested in counting, mostly big, nasty, gross flies. And then finally, the other thing you'll see are these 3D tube traps. Now these are 3D printed, at least the part that's the head is. The rest of these are really easy home DIY and they actually just release the, the group that patented this, release the 3D printed file and all the instructions for making these. So if you're a group that does your own internal R&D, this is not a bad idea. I say that because B trays severely underestimate how many trachnides you have in a block. Now, for those of you that have a lot of trachnides, you're going to amply catch them on beet trays and you're going to get a good sense that they're there. If you've got a moderate population of trachnides, which is what this orchard pictured in this graph has, that bottom line, those are the beet tray counts. We're talking one and two a week at best on a beet tray with a team of five entomologists staring at them, looking for them. The sticky cards actually catch your peaks and troughs in your population so you can actually track their phenology and know if they're out there. 
so that if you think you might not have trachonitis, you might actually do have, have them and in decent numbers, but the beet trays just aren't, aren't picking them up. The other big problem with the beet trays, as we all saw with those little samples today, they're tiny. So if you've got any other wasp and it's a parasitoid of something else in abundance in your orchard, good luck telling them apart on a beet tray and good luck getting your hand lens out fast enough to look at it before it decides to jet. You might get lucky and you might get a good look at it, but not all of them. So I think if we're, if you're, especially again, if you're doing internal R and D, your best way to monitor is either going to be the screen sticky card. If you're not next to a dairy orchard, you might be okay and happy with an unscreened sticky card. Or if you really want to get into it, these cylinder traps. Um, I will mention the screening material. This is dressmaker's tool. It is like a dollar, two dollars a roll, and is very sparkly and wonderful. So if you want to add some sparkle to your life while you're trapping for insects and also get rid of fill flies, that's the way to do it. Um, the other really cool sampling method um, was we heard anecdotally from somebody that had heard it from somebody that had heard it from somebody else. Like one of those, like my grandpa said, like in the 1850s, this worked kind of thing. And we're like, that sounds crazy and there's no way that'll work. You take a piece of cardboard from a box. So we're talking not the kind you use for earwig traps, but ones that have two sides on it. And you cut it into little tiny strips. You take those strips and you staple them to your pear tree right when the bark goes from smooth to rough. Um, so you're focusing on the newer growth, put it on the smooth part, and then leave it out in the orchard over the winter and pull it before spring starts to happen. What we found that Trachnides does for the winter is they get their egg inside the parasilla. And instead of turning into an adult like a normal parasilla would in the winter time, the Trachnides takes over the brain of the parasilla and says, crawl until you find shelter. It does so. And then it turns into a mummy. And so what we're doing here is basically making fake bark that they crawl into and then turn into a mummy. So now you've got a way to sample your overwintering populations of parasilla. And I think if you've got an orchard that maybe wasn't IPM and now it is, and you don't have trachnides and you want some, and you've got a neighboring block maybe that you've grown organically and you know it has trachnides, this is a really easy way to move them from one orchard to another with garbage, because I love working with garbage. Other results from trachnides are, in general, we're finding it's incredibly pesticide sensitive. So the recommendations you're following for other IPM, continue following them for trachnides because it's, it's kind of a wimp, especially in the adult stage. Uh, it does a lot better when it's in the mummy stage. It's a low disperser, which again means you're probably gonna have to reseed it if you've got an orchard that was conventional. Uh, to get it back in there because it's not great at flying from one spot to the next. Um, we've also found in monitoring orchards and kind of a grid pattern that it's less prone to having hot spots than Parasilla is. So we just we assumed initially we'd see lots of Trachnides clumped where there were also lots of Parasilla and that was true but not to the level we thought it was going to be. But I think this is something that we can use for targeted IPM because if you have a more conventional orchard and you have a hot spot that you want to treat, just treat the hot spot, and you might still have enough trachnides in there to repopulate that area later because they were more all over the orchard than focused in that hot spot. So this is kind of a, an idea that we're working on developing in terms of more targeted pest management. And then finally, we are finding that trachnides does use floral food resources. We don't know which ones yet. Um, we did a bunch of DNA work and basically pulled the DNA out of their guts, and we're going to find out what plants are in there. So there may be certain plants um, that are going to be more common and useful for trachnides as food. We definitely got things out of the DNA that were not pear. So there, there are things out there that are important. Um, Gabe is working on modeling results to see if we can determine what control levels you can expect based on counts of trachnides and how that looks for percent parasitism. Um, model results to determine what pesticides are most correlated with low or high trachnides population. So a good sense of things to avoid and things that are probably safe. And then finally, those little strips are also giving us a good sense of overwintering phenology. They're a lot safer from pesticides when they're in that mummy stage. So if we know when they're becoming a mummy, we know when it's maybe a little bit safer to spray, especially if they're nice and deep in the bark. Uh, a little bit about earwigs. So this is also a great question to ask uh, Robert about, but this is a project that's been led by my PhD student, Aldo. Um, and as Robert mentioned during some of the Q&A, one of our questions was, 
can we actually basically, and I love this, all those calling them biofactories, can we use cherry and nectarine blocks as biofactories for generating lots of earwigs where they're unwanted and then take them away and huck them into pear and apple orchards, which is especially great for those of you who have a cherry block and have a pear block. So he's been testing this question. In terms of the mass trapping, he's finding that in most situations, you don't really see, unfortunately, a substantial decrease in the number of earwigs, even after you've been mass trapping for a while. However, um, I don't know how clear that is for most folks. The smaller graph is indicating to you that we catch about 10,000 earwigs in a season with only trapping on a few trees. Like you can get a lot of earwigs if you're in the right cherry orchard. Same deal, um, or that was the apricot. So the same deal on the cherries. Again, this is about 20,000 earwigs. Um, so this is a great way to get a lot of earwigs. In this case, we did see a little bit of a dip in 2022 in the number of earwigs in this orchard. So we might actually be knocking their numbers back in the cherries a little bit. Um, but the big picture here is if you have one of these soft fruit crops, this is a great way, especially if I was talking to a grower that had a person that was basically on disability, they tore their rotator cuff and couldn't go in and prune. So he had him make earwig traps for the entire time he was on low physical activity duty. And that's what they did. They're going out and they're, they're uh, this is in Southern Oregon, they're trapping the earwigs out of their cherries and moving them into their pears. So this is a, this is a tactic where you can basically uh, rob Peter to pay Paul, but Peter's cool with it because earwigs are a nuisance in Peter's cherry orchard. We are seeing um, in some cases that this does bump down pear silla abundance. In particular, um, if you look at the uh, 2022 data um, here at the bottom, and this is doing either one big massive release or releasing smaller numbers continuously. The massive releases seem to do a better job at, at knocking back numbers. Uh, we're also seeing evidence um, that some of these releases are doing a good job. This orchard actually had a European red mite problem um, and knocking back mite numbers. And I also want to point out this orchard already had earwigs in it. If you have an orchard that for whatever reason you've sprayed earwigs out of, I think this would work even better because you're basically reseeding a population. So all of those folks, and I know Robert is going to start talking to folks who have switched over to IPM and don't have earwigs. This might be a strategy that works really well for you. And finally, I mentioned I was going to do a super duper preliminary overview on our MITE survey work. Um, so basically the question with this work is what factors cause outbreaks of spider mites and rust bites? Um, this project is currently being led by my lab manager, Erica Moretti. And we are looking at all kinds of potential factors here. So what are your, what are you, what are your weeds look like? How wide is your herbicide strip? Um, what are the, what's the weed composition? How tall are they getting? What pesticides are you spraying? What was the weather like that particular day that we sampled? Um, is there a cor negative correlation between parasilla and spider mites? And of course, what predators did you have? And we were also testing those predators to see if they have spider mite or pear rust mite DNA in their guts to be like, for sure, hey, this, this, this one ate fairly recently a mite. So very preliminarily, what we have found is not shocking, especially given what we heard from Robert and Louie, which is that because of the spray programs used in the Wenatchee Valley, the Wenatchee Valley has way more spider mites than the Yakima Valley and the Hood River area. You, we could not find of the, the orchards that were surveyed a single one that did not have spider mites to a degree that would be noticeable. In Yakima, at least a handful of our orchards didn't really have spider mites at all. Some had a few, and then we had one that was maybe significant enough for a treatment. And Hood River, I think we literally found five spider mites for the entire season. They're just not there. And I don't think climate is what's driving this. I think, again, this really is going to come back to our spray programs. Um, and maybe maybe some things to do with nearby plants, but I think the spray programs are going to be the big indicator. So one of the things that we'll be doing as part of this modeling effort is looking to see which pesticides in particular are affiliated with having really, really high spider mite populations. So we'll be doing this uh, for one more year, um, and then we'll be using all of that information to kind of generate these models as to what, what could potentially be causing these outbreaks. Finally, like the last big impression I got from a very quick glance at the data for the season we're not really seeing a lot of predator mites. Now, in like the one orchard that had a crap ton of spider mites, that was where I at least got a, like a, a nice, maybe a small amount. But comparing 
that to what I typically see in Apple, both an Apple that has hardly any spider mites and then Apple that has decent numbers of spider mites, we just don't have a lot of predator mites in pear. And I think some of that has to do with the biology of pear trees and what the predator mites prefer in terms of pear architecture. So I think we're going to need to really focus in terms of mite control on other predators that are out there. And one of the things I'm really interested in, and there's a postdoc Bonnie at our facility is really interested in, are whirly gig mites. Um, some of you may be familiar with the little red dudes that run in really, really fast circles. Um, and you occasionally see them on bins at the end of the season. They seem to be incredibly effective Scylla predators. And I would not be surprised if they weren't also eating spider mites like gangbusters, um, as long as the webbing doesn't get too bad. So that's, that's something we're going to be digging into in the future. With that, I'd like to thank literally everyone on this slide and probably lots and lots of people that aren't on this slide. Um, but this has definitely been a labor of love uh, to get more info out on natural enemies to the pair community. Um, do you want...